Can everybody hear me? Okay? All right, great. So uh, good afternoon, and uh, I'm happy to be here and talk to you today about recycling and waste. So think about waste. I mean, just the word waste. I mean, it's a, it's a noun, it's an adjective, it's a verb, right? And it has so many meanings. And so, uh, I mean, think about it. There's uh, barren wasteland, you know, and there's to lay waste to something is to destroy it. Um, <coughs> what would be some other feces, you know, we say you know, waste, human waste or animal waste. Um, wasting time. Waste, sometimes people refer to, you know, something that's unnecessary or superfluous. Um, and then in the environmental area, I mean, we, we refer to, you know, maybe uh, uh, hospital waste, radioactive waste, organic waste, landfill waste, right? So I, had, I was thinking about this, and I, you know, had this kind of, you know, funny thought that if an alien agent was coming, you know, to, the, to Earth to kind of scout us, you know, and he might go back and say, humans love waste, you know? <laughs> Because they have so many words for it, and they're always talking about it. And, and then, then further, th that agent might say, well, but the rest of nature doesn't really think much about waste or even deal with waste. You know? So there's kind of a disconnect here. So th that's kind of one of my points today, is how can we uh, <coughs> you know, maybe be more like nature and not think of waste as waste and, and garbage, but something we can do something with. And so, you know, this point about nature. So, you know, think of the dung beetle. So, uh, you know, the dung beetle, you know, lives on some other organism's waste, goes in it, it eats it, right? I mean, this isn't waste. This is like, this is like gold, you know? This is like great stuff, right? So, um, so it's a little different perspective. And then uh, my career, I've worked on bacteria that eat things in hazardous waste, landfills, and other places. So dealing with things like PCBs and perchloroethylene, dry cleaning solvent, you know, other pest, you know, concentrated pesticides and other things. And these microbes, they're eating it, right? So it's not waste, it's, it's food to, the, to those bacteria, right? So I've studied, you know, the, the mechanisms of how this happens and, uh, you know, really gotten into how these enzymes evolved, which, you know, there's some really kind of interesting kind of fundamental science ab about that. But, you know, I've been kind of the typical academic where I would, you know, in the end of my papers or in the grants, you know, I would always <coughs> say something about, you know, this, this fundamental knowledge could be used in, in this way. And, you know, uh, it was always like, well, someone else will use it, you know, not me, but, you know, somebody will pick this up. And, you know, I, I mean, I believe that, and there are some cases where some things uh, were picked up by other people and used. But then, you know, something changed a few years ago, and I want to point that out. Um, you know, so I had kind of a change of heart in saying, well, I should really do something with this and not just, you know, let other people do it. And so this thing was... Uh, melamine in China. So do probably a lot of you raise your hand if you remember that, right? So, yeah, so a lot of you uh, heard about reports coming out of China a number of years ago where somebody had put melamine in milk powder and this was getting distributed. It got in infant formula, so, so children were going into the hospital. I mean, it was tragic and, I mean, to give you the, you know, the magnitude of this, 150,000 children went to the hospital, some died from kidney failure, right? So this was, this was awful. And it was tracked down to melamine in milk powder, so people were, were diluting the milk and then putting the melamine in to kind of fool the system and, and uh, got away with it for a while, but, but not uh, fortunately uh, uh, for a long time. But the, the World Health Organization called, was calling for a rapid test to detect melamine in milk. And so this makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, if you're, you know, the truck is going out to pick up the milk at the dairy, right? And that, that truck driver, right? I mean, he can't send the milk to, you know, the testing lab in Beijing and wait three days, right? So you have to have something that you can mix, look at it and say, you know, yes, this is good milk. 
no, it's bad milk, you know, we're not going to pick it up, we're not going to mix it with the rest of the milk. So, and I realized we had something that could do that because my lab had worked on bacteria that, that eat melamine. And as part of that, they, the first enzyme that initiates that metabolic pathway to, to consume melamine is to release ammonia from, from the melamine ring. And there's, uh, there's easy tests for ammonia that have been developed in clinical labs for you know, ammonia in blood and urine. So we could just put the enzyme in, <coughs> let it sit for a little while, add some reagents, stir it up, it would turn blue if there's melamine. So this is something, you know, could be, you know, a kid, add A, add B, stir it up. If it turns blue, you know, throw away the milk don't, don't, or don't take that milk. So uh, I got together with a uh, person I knew at a food testing lab, and within a few months, we had this uh, out on the market. And they were selling it in China. They sold thousands. And uh, you know, I like to think that it, I don't know exactly, but I like to think that it did some good, right, because hopefully prevented some children from getting some of this bad milk. So this, this was really gratifying to me. I mean, I said, wow, you know, I mean, this is something, you know, we did at a fundamental level, but now it really translated to something that was really important. And so, um, you know, I got very interested in this, and I'd like to give you one other example. Um, that, and this happened around the same time. And so these two kind of put me over the top, you know, it kind of changed my outlook in terms of you know, the way I was going to approach science. And so what happened is I was consulting for Dow Chemical Company. And I want to you know, give credit, actually. So this idea was not my idea. This came from Dow, but I just helped a little bit with kind of making it work and helping them to kind of implement it. <coughs> but it was really a beautiful idea uh, by, Dow, by Dow scientists. So really, the issue was this. So, so there was um, Dow was making a billion pounds of epichlorohydrin, right? Big chemical company, they make commodity chemicals. Now the issue was that there was a, you know, it's very good process chemistry. You know, 97% yield is, is pretty good, especially on something on this scale. But there was a 3% waste stream. And 3% of a billion pounds is 30 million pounds, right? So that's a lot of waste, right? And so they were paying to have that land hazardous waste landfill. So think about it. It's, you know, it's losing. You have to use a little more raw, raw materials you, to get the amount of material that you want at the end. Then you have to pay to, to, to basically have it handled by, by some group. And then there's a liability, right? If something happens, it can come back to Dow and they get a lawsuit, right? So, so you know, that's, that's not a great thing for, for the company as well as, you know, for society, you know, to having this, this extra waste. So the biotech group came up with this idea to use an enzyme to take a chlorine off, replace it with a hydroxyl group. And this is where I could, I work, I've worked on dehalogenase enzymes, so I could help them a little bit with this part of it. But it's a beautiful idea because then you take that waste stream, you make it back into the final product. And the CEO of Dow loved this, right? He's like, wow, you know, you're going to make, you know, I can use less raw materials. I can get the same amount of material. I don't have liability. I don't have to pay waste, you know, handling costs. This is great, right? So, so there's a message here, too, is that, you know, we need more ideas like this is one. But the other thing is that this was implemented very quickly. And so if we come up with these ideas, they're embraced. And they're embraced very quickly. So, so this is what I'm kind, you know, want to talk about today. And in a way, um, you know, I don't have. I'm going to talk about <coughs> things where it's not all solved. I don't. I I don't have all the answers. And <coughs> you know, probably with the, you know where I am in my career trajectory, I'm probably not going to take on all of these problems and and try to address them. So, one of my messages and one of my reasons for wanting to talk to you today is to sort of encourage the students, postdocs, people who are earlier in their career, maybe starting a lab. These are big questions, big problems, and if you can solve some of them, you can make a big difference. You know, you can make a real impact on the world. So, so if I give you a little bit of inspiration to, to maybe one or two people, I'll feel I've, I've done something good here today.
So I want to talk about cycling of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, just to kind of give the big picture. And again, so these are, these are the elements in our body, right? After water, so hydrogen and oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus are the main things in living things, right? So in our bodies, plants, animals, bacteria. So, you know, this is really important to us. And it's also, these are kind of the major kind of commodity elements that are in all kinds of things from foods to, you know, chemicals. And if we think about how to cycle them, um, you know, we can do a lot. And of course, with carbon, I'm going to start with carbon. And of course, no surprise, you know, the big thing that everybody talks about with carbon now is carbon dioxide, right? Because of climate change and implications of that. And, and uh, you know, we hear about this daily. And so what can we do about it? Well, um, I think one of the things would be to think more creatively, you know, like this example with Dow Chemical, where to think of carbon dioxide not just as a waste, but as something we can use. So how do we do that? So I want to give you one example, <coughs> and this is something illustrative from my work. The rest of it will be from, from some other people's work that I'll highlight and other kind of areas. But so this has to do with ethanol, right? So I, I worked in biofuels, making different kinds of biofuels, not ethanol. But you know, a number of years ago, when ethanol was like a big rage, right? You know, 10, 15 years ago, and they were building ethanol plants in Iowa and Minnesota like crazy. And, and you know, there were some things coming out of here that, that may, well, maybe that's not the best thing in terms of, you know, looking at the overall balance of what you put in, what you get out. But there's a fundamental problem that's even bigger in some way. And I was talking to Jack Richmond, a chemist in my lab, and I credit him actually with this idea that I'm going to talk about. Um, we were look, you know, looking at the ethanol fermentation, right? You make ethanol and carbon dioxide, and you actually look at the mass the, from the sugar molecule to the mass of the two products, that they're about equal mass. So 50% of what you start with is going up the stack and wasted, right? So that's a big waste, right? That's, that's kind of crazy, and that makes this process, right from the start, really inefficient. So uh, I was talking to Jack Richmond about this, and he said, well, you know, I can make ethanol into ethylene oxide, and then we, can, then we can do a reaction under pressure and hook the carbon dioxide back on and make this molecule, ethylene carbonate. Well, it turns out ethylene carbonate is a green solvent. It's replacing some other more toxic things. It's in lithium batteries. The, the industrial need for, uh, for ethylene carbonate is going up about 10% a year. So this is a big deal in industry. There's a big desire for this. And now, so we, we, we got a, um, a grant for this. We worked on it. We actually showed proof of concept. And then we talked to our commercial, uh, technology commercialization office at the university. And they did some you know, work uh, looking around. And they said, well, it looks like Shell and Hunt Chemical and some others have, have kind of beat you to the punch because there's just some patents that published that, that were filed on this. Now, it was initially disappointing, but now thinking about it, this is great, right? Because industry is doing something about this. I mean, so this is an, there's a need. And instead of make, you know, working on a process to make something where we throw away half of the carbon up the stack, it's now being, by the way, that final product, you're recouping 98% of the, of the mass and all of the carbon, right? So no carbon dioxide. So you're losing two protons, basically. You know? so, so it's a very efficient process. So I think this is the kind of thing I think we need to think about. And, and, and the good news is that people are. So how many of you have heard of the Carbon X Prize? So anybody in the audience? So, so this website, they're offering $20 million for ideas of how to use carbon dioxide effectively, all right? And so, of course, you probably just couldn't write a, you know, a few lines or a paragraph and get the $20 million. I think it has to be a great idea and something that's scalable, something that could be economical, something that can be implemented. So I'm sure there's, there's some rules there. But 
I think this is a great sign that people are saying, let's do something. Let's really look at how we can use uh, carbon dioxide where, where it's increasing in the atmosphere. We have all these point sources. Let's use it. Let's not, let's not throw it away into the atmosphere, right? That's causing our problems. But the issue is, of course, always to think about how you can do this economically. So these things are going on now. So I already talked about a green solvent idea. There are people who are trying to, um, and I was just at this Pacific Chem meeting uh, in Hawaii in December. There are a lot of talks on this, uh, Japanese groups, American groups, European groups, doing things like hooking up uh, solar cells to you know, get electrons to reduce carbon dioxide and make methanol, which can be used as a liquid fuel. You can make polymers. So one of the interesting things is cement. This, this really excites me because you know, cement is, is a major contributor to carbon dioxide, cement manufacturer, right? Because we use a lot of cement in society. And the, the current process where you're heating this uh, minerals up, up to high temperature, you drive off a lot of carbon dioxide. So there are people who are, have, and there's a company actually that's, that's developed a process where they take flue gas, so basically concentrated source of CO2, and, and capture that to make cement. And, and the beauty of this, right, the other process you know, emits CO2, this, this consumes CO2. Right, so I, I, I don't know the economics. I haven't looked into this in detail, but I really hope they're successful because we'll get rid of a major, major source of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere if, if these guys, because if these guys are successful, clearly everybody's gonna jump on this, right? So, so that's a really good thing. All right, so my other uh, uh, element, uh, one of the second element I wanna talk about is nitrogen. So here I'm showing you the form of nitrogen that's all around us, right? Nitrogen gas. Um, that's, that's sort of part of my story where I think maybe we can learn from nature and, and make an improvement and recycle and, and basically eliminate a lot of waste. So how would we do this? Well, um, as you know, uh, you know, so nitrogen has been used to uh, promote plant growth for centuries. And even before people realized how it worked, I mean, people were putting manure right onto plants and that would stimulate the growth. Well, um, <clears throat> then about, you know, in the 1800s, scientists figured out, well, it was this nitrogenous component in the manure that was largely boosting uh, the plants and, and making, you know, making them grow faster and better. So the, uh, the race was on then to get, uh, nitrogen fertilizer to feed the world. The first place uh, that it was obtained in large quantities was here. This is the Atacama Desert where I was, uh, I was here in, in, there in December. Um, amazing place, I mean, you know, to go there and just see the driest spot on earth. So the, the reason that, ba so basically that white that you're looking at is salts just laying in the desert, right? So people can just scrape up nitrate salts and bag it, and that's what they did you know, 100, 150 years ago. This was a, the major source of fertilizer in the world because it was just laying there. Because this place is it hasn't rained in 400 years, so it doesn't wash away. <clears throat> so it's a pretty, pretty unique spot on Earth. Now, something changed, right, about 100 years ago. I mean, probably <coughs> most of you know about this, right, the Haber-Bosch process. So, <coughs> This was then, the, this was a process that could take nitrogen out of the air, um, reduce it with hydrogen gas, and then make ammonia. And as you can see from that number on the right, a trillion pounds. I mean, this is a huge, huge process. In fact, so one way to think about this is half the nitrogen in your body and my body come, went through that process, okay? So this is like globally a dominant part of the nitrogen cycle, right? So it's, it's pretty amazing. So that's how big it is. Now, the other part of it, right, is you have to have a source of hydrogen. And if you look in that middle box, right, there you have to have very high temperature and pressure. It takes a lot of energy, right? So this is a major, major source of, so this uses, consumes a huge amount of natural gas, and it's a, it's a major contributor, again, to carbon dioxide. 
So here's even a case if we do something about nitrogen and use and recycle and do something about waste with nitrogen, we're also impacting the carbon budget, right, and, and climate change. So, so this, this could have enormous impacts. So nature um, does this, okay? Um, you probably know, right, that there are bacteria that can do that same chemistry, a little bit differently, but um, at the active site of an enzyme, nitrogenase, nitrogen gets reduced to make ammonia, all right? And there are bacteria that, that associate with plants and feed plants, right? So legumous plants, um, we have uh, make nodules and they attract the bacteria. Bacteria go in, they fix nitrogen, feed the plant, the plant feeds the bacteria. It's a nice symbiotic relationship. Now people have been studying this for, for a long time, but um, it's not been applied or it's not applicable because the only this small number of plants form these nodules and most of them are not crop plants, right? So our major grains and corn and things like that, I mean, do not make nodules and get fertilized by this process, unfortunately. But now I think there's some really exciting new developments where that, that couldn't be done 30, 20, 30 years ago, but now people have sort of reformatted the nitrogen fixation complex and are basically making bacteria that can fix nitrogen and, and feed all kinds of plants. And this is really, I think, very, very exciting stuff because if we can really cut down on the Haber-Bosch process, we're doing something really big. The other, the other um, observations and reports that are just coming out in the last year, and I'm not an expert on this, but I just read this in science because I think it's uh, you know, great stuff and really important, that, that there, there's now evidence that, that some bacteria that live on the leaves of plants that some of that nitrogen that they fix actually gets into the plant and promotes the growth of plants. So we need to understand this better so maybe we can make this work better that then hopefully we, we could use either much less fertilizer or no fertilizer to grow some of our crop plants. And that would make a huge impact on, on the world, on the environment. You know, not only the process of saving carbon, di uh, carbon and, and, and having less carbon dioxide emission, but nitrate runoff, right, is due to this you know, heavy input of fertilizer. Um, if, we can, if we can have this process happening, we probably also solve the runoff problem. So you know, there's a lot of good that could come out of this type of research. So this is the kind of thing that's going on now in various labs around, around the world. So the, so the last um, element I'd like to talk about is, is phosphate, right? And so phosphate, again, is an essential nutrient that's in our DNA, right? It's in the nucleic acids of all living things. And there are some people that are talking about phosphate or, or referring to it as a crisis, right? Because they see that, that we are facing some big issues because if we look at the known reserves of phosphate, we could actually run out. So people are referring to this as the phosphate crisis. And, and this group is even uh, estimating that this could happen. Sort of peak phosphate um, in commerce could come as early as 2033. So not, not that far in the future. So this is kind of scary because, you know, uh, we, 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 again, we need phosphate to stimulate plant growth. It's, it's in fertilizer mixtures. We run out of phosphate, there's going to be mass starvation. So, so this is a major, major problem. And now phosphate is different in terms of cyclic, right? It doesn't have that gaseous part component like carbon and nitrogen. But there is kind of a, a global kind of human-made cycle of phosphate. And, and so that has to do <coughs> with wh where phosphate <coughs> comes from, which is largely here. So what country is that? Morocco. Okay, so you guys know all about this probably. So the major source of phosphate in the world is Morocco, as you, as you know. And um, the, from some, some reports I've seen, they think that those re you know, known reserves could run out in this kind of period of a couple decades. So we either find lots of uh, phosphate or we, or we do something better, right? And, and we could do something better even if we had more phosphate. Because you know, this is a beautiful example 
you know, if, if I'm teaching chemistry, I think I might use this to, to uh, illustrate the con concept of entropy, right? Because phosphate is very concentrated right in these rocks in, in Morocco and a few other places where it's mined. And then it gets shipped out around and goes into various places. Then it gets distributed on the farm fields. It runs off and gets, you know, it's getting more and more dilute, right? So over time, it's getting more and more disordered. And as you know, I mean, if you want to take something that's very disordered and make it very ordered, you have to put a lot of energy in, right? So uh, that's the issue, right? If we have to rely on physical and chemical methods to concentrate all that phosphate, you know, we're going to be burning a lot of fossil fuels, you know, we're going to be causing other problems. So, so what could we do? So one thing is that uh, a colleague of mine in, in biochemistry, Michael Elias, is very interested in how bacteria sequester phosphate when they're in very dilute environments. So he goes to these you know, lakes where there's you know, almost unmeasurable phosphate. There are bacteria growing. They must, they're making DNA. They must be getting phosphate. And it turns out that they have this exquisite binding protein and, and pump to draw this phosphate into the cell. So uh, the, these very high affinity uh, pro, uh, proteins. So he's thinking he can get bacteria to, to sequester phosphate against a very uh, you know, low outside and then sequester it inside the cell. Now, if you do this in wastewater treatment plants, now you could, you could potentially capture the, the phosphate. You'd also have nitrogen. Now that sludge is a, is a valuable commodity instead of just landfilling it as a you know a nuisance. You know we got to get rid of the biomass so we can you know keep the water plant working. You could bag it and and just dry it down and use it as fertilizer. Be, might be a great fertilizer, right? So these are the kind of things that I think we need to do, and it's really recycling instead of just now taking that phosphate and spreading it out. Now we're reusing that same phosphate over and over within our same local environment. It makes a lot of sense if we can do this technically. All right, so just in the last few minutes, I want to say a little bit about, you know, there's, there's ideas, but there's also implementation. And that's kind of what I learned with the, you know, the, the case of the Dow example or, you know, my own experience with the melamine test kit. There has to be somebody that wants to do it, and there has to be some kind of economic incentive. So how do we make this happen? So, that, so that ultimately, to answer this, what I'm calling you know, today for my talk, the big question, how can we recycle things better? All right, so how can, we have to do this on scale in order to make an impact? Well, um, you know, we could look to politics, right? You know, and, and you know, good uh, political leadership is always desired. You know, we're in the middle of a election season, so maybe that, that, that doesn't instill always confidence, you know? <laughs> in the political process, but certainly that's, that's one area that, that could help. And then, you know, social movements and, and just, you know, people desiring this change. I mean, INE &E is, is big in this, right? I mean, educating people and informing the general public, not just the people in the university, right, to, to on important issues. Um, technology. You know, I, I really feel, you know, we, we need some advances in that nitrogen fixation, um, that, that phosphate uptake, you know, there's a little bit more work to do to really make this at a, at a, at a level technically that we could pull this off. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's economic, you know, there's businesses, and will businesses bring this forward, you know, uh, in order to see, well, we can make a profit on this, let's, let's do it. Well, what I'm calling, and I have it kind of circled because this is what I kind of like as a possibility, right, this combination of technology and an and economic incentive to bring it forward. And, and how, can we, how can we kind of make this happen? Well, I'm just going to make one last kind of comment um, because, you know, I think in the past, a lot of times in U.S. and, you know, even when I was like in grade school, I mean, you know, I was learning about these big companies and the, the wonderful inventions that they made. And, and I mean, this was true. I mean, so I was compiling, I was using Bell Laboratories as an example for this lecture. And I started making a list of all the things that came out of Bell Laboratories. And I, it just blew me away. It was like, oh my God, like I had, I, I didn't, I knew they were, you know, pretty, 
pretty amazing, but not this amazing. So this is a list of the Nobel Prizes for people that worked at Bell Laboratories, the uh, discoveries or things that they helped bring forward, and you know everything from solar cells to Unix to you know radio astronomy, and the list just goes on and on. It's just uh, amazing. I don't need to read this. Just just the sheer magnitude of this list, I think, speaks a lot. But you know, th and th this is. This is maybe the, the problem is by 2000, you know what Bell Labs looked like? It's empty, right? Because it was not you know, deemed to be making the, the company money, right? So it was great discoveries, but maybe other companies were grabbing these things. It, it didn't become the corporate kind of culture you know, to, to, to have this kind of high-tech center, which is really a shame, right? I mean, it's really um, too bad. But so I think we have to look to not to this model because this is the old model, right? I mean, this was great in the 20s and 30s and 40s. It, was, it, it did a lot. But maybe today, you know, there's a, there's a new model. And, and I like to think that it's, you know, a lot of you young guys, the, the students and the postdocs and the people starting their careers in, in academia or people that are what entrepreneurs that want to start new businesses, and I think that's the way of the future. So the students, I mean, I just had this to illustrate students, and I didn't, I didn't want a picture of students in the, around the campus or in classrooms, so here they're in front of Mount Kilimanjaro, right? So it's like this, this spirit of getting out there and doing things, not just you know, taking exams and, and doing class assignments, but getting things done in the real world. And I think that's beautiful, and I think that that can be kind of our saving grace, because I do believe that the, the way that we're going to have to innovate in the future is with this kind of cycle, where there's university creativity, um, startups that sometimes come out of the university or out of university technology that maybe gets licensed, you know, some patent gets filed at the U, some small company uh, maybe says, oh, this fits our, our business model, let's, let's license it. And then ultimately, either, you know, I mean, I don't mean to imply that you know only it's eating the big guys are eating this. I think sometimes the small companies. I mean, Medtronic started out at the University of Minnesota, and now it's a multinational billion, multi-billion dollar company. But I think in some cases, you know, some things will grow. The little guy might grow, but the other model would be that the big guy, you know, basically says, "Oh, this is the way of the future." You know, we're going to change the way we do business, the way we do this, and we're going to take this on. And I mean, okay, sometimes then the bigger gets bigger, but you know, if it works, I think there's a lot of ways to 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 get to where we want to go, which is really to implement these things that are good for society, and also make sense and and can make some economic sense. So um, with that, I just like to. You know, finish up, and, and so my last kind of thing is to uh, let's let's look to nature and let's recycle. Thank you very much. a quick question while um, while the audience is thinking of questions then sure. so the university recently announced uh, the big grand challenges initiative they named the grand challenges um, what, what are your thoughts on universities as engines of innovation as you alluded to in the next to last slide and what still needs to happen I guess to even be more proactive to have more of the examples such as the ones you've been working on to come to fruition sure so I, I think the university first of all let me just say you know because I've been here for a couple decades so I'd say the university has come a long way in terms of, um, you know, being able to evaluate, you know, an idea, um, to take it forward, to make decisions about whether patent should be filed or not, and then to even work with industry. And you know, I think, um, you know, with, and then since since Kaler has been president, you know, I think, you know, he's had the philosophy, which I think, which I agree with, you know, that well, if we have patents. You know, rather than trying to get a million dollars for every patent, I would rather you know get a small amount of money and have it out there rather than just holding out for the highest bidder kind of thing. 
And I think that's the spirit, you know, that we need to make contacts. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've worked with industry. I've had grants from industry. And it can be challenging, but I think as those big companies cut their research budgets, then they look more to the universities as a sort of a, a, you know, fairly inexpensive form of research in a way. And then if it's set up right, it can be a win-win. So that's, so that's what we really have to have the university with the people who know how to do those kinds of, manage those kinds of things. It's a different skill set too, I think. But yeah. yeah. Hi, thanks for a great talk. That was Hi. really interesting. Um, at IONE here, one of the types of innovation that I think we find ourselves doing a lot is software innovation, and it is typically open source. Okay. And so that's going to have some differences with the sorts of patents and IP type of questions that you're talking about here. But I was wondering if you had any experience or any perspective on how a group like ours, which generates open source content, fits within this process of your three different fish. Um, in, in terms of scaling strategies, okay. and that's and I, I ask this because this debate about around what's the best scaling strategy for some of the things we've produced has been a big discussion in some of our research endeavors. contaminated, you have to put in a lot of energy mm -hmm. to keep things clean. And so this was kind of the thing that I can't wrap my head around um, when I think about how viable those solutions are. So I was just wondering, um, I guess if you've thought about that, if there are mm -hmm. solutions to that, and maybe I guess in a more broader sense, is there a place for an ecologist to have ideas which are useful for these kinds of solutions? Because I feel like if you could, if you had ideas about coming up with steady states of communities of bacteria mm -hmm. which you know cycle in such a way that they are no longer prone to contamination from the outside world mm -hmm. then you'd come up with a, s a system that's that's yeah, sustainable more sustainable yeah. and has a little more life. yeah that's a very good question i've thought a little bit about that i mean that's not my research area but you know when i hear talks about it and talk to people but some of some of those same ideas so actually there's, so there's two developments so one is more the engineered bacteria where, where they're making it, where it would fix nitrogen and then associate with the plant. So it's more of a kind of an engineered solution. Um, learn, I mean, using the natural kind of genes, but then, then in a more artificial construct. And then the other that I think is exciting is that people observing that this happens in nature outside of these leguminous plants that it's also happening in certain other plants where they're getting fed. So this is 
a natural process that I think we don't fully understand. So that, that, in that case, those, those microbes are being maintained in that environment. The plant is deriving benefit. How is that working? You know, is the, are they getting something from the plant? And I think we can understand those better. Maybe it's just more tweaking nature as opposed to using a more engineered heavy solution. So I think, you know, there's, there's maybe two approaches there. Because I think you're right, if you, I mean, the, 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 the nitrogen fixing process is, you know, is a drain on ATP of the cell. It's a, it requires energy, just like the hubbard bosch does. It's more efficient, but it still requires, of course, energy. So, so those bacteria, you know, if they're, if they're not getting an, a much enough benefit back, they might mutate and lose that ability very readily in the environment. That's another thing is just will, will it be effective because if the cell grows faster when it mutates and doesn't fix nitrogen anymore, that's probably going to happen pretty quickly, right? So, so yeah, I think there's some real, and that's why I'm saying I think these are not solved problems, but they're really interesting problems. And then this idea of, of communities I think is interesting. I don't know if anybody's exploring that, but that, that would be something might be worth looking into. We have an online question about biomimicry. Uh, this person is asking, or they're saying that they're really interested in biomimicry. Um, ro what role does that play in all of this that you've been discussing today? And the second part of their question is, how can they bring something like biomimicry to the University of Minnesota? This person mentions that uh, Arizona State University has a master's degree in biomimicry. And we at the U have a bioengineering plus other degrees that are inter interdisciplinary. So I'd like to see more biomimicry courses and opportunities at the university. Okay, well I think you know at, at the core, some of this is biomimicry. I mean, we're, what we're trying to do is, you know, rather than using a process of you know, burning natural gas and fixing nitrogen, now to learn, okay, nature does it. I mean, we know the efficiency of the natural process is many times higher than the chemical process. So, so th that's actually one line of research that people are doing is, is to make the chemical process better by learning from the natural system. How is that, that, that enzyme active site set up? You know, I mean, it would certainly help if we could make the Haber-Bosch three or four times more efficient. That would, that would be good. I mean, that, would, that wouldn't solve all the problems, but it would, it would be a big improvement. So I'm not doing that research, so I guess I I'm not, can't comment too much. But, and then what I study a lot is bioremediation, biodegradation. So in, in my case, I'm very interested in using biological processes to deal with waste where, you know, basically we, we consume it as opposed to other things that might sequester it, absorb it with activated carbon, things like that. So, so that, I, I, I don't know if you call that biomimicry, but it's a bioprocess that, that is implemented. So, so building on the previous two questions, and I, I'm, you may have already answered this, but in, think, in looking for interesting problems, mm -hmm. do you th think about them differently, and particularly Lindsay brings in the, the ecology, mm -hmm. you know, you've been talking pretty much about chemistry right. in the, in sure. the lab. Mm -hmm. So are there different ways that you found as you've moved through these problems, are you, do you find you think about identifying problems differently than you did earlier in your career? Well, yeah, I think be because, you know, and, and as Lindsay pointed out, I mean, to, to make these work, you have to think about it more holistically. Right, so if it, anything that's going to be in a water treatment plant, it's not going to be a pure culture, one organism. It's going to be some population, and we need to know how that whole, you know, mixture works together. And I think the same way in the nitrogen fixation, if we're going to be doing it, making bio, biological nitrogen fixation work on a broader scale, it's it's not it's not a clean system. You know, in the laboratory, you could have a pure culture on the leaves and do this, but but in 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 the farmer's field, it's, it's going to be a much more, there, there's going to be a lot more communities, other factors where I think ecology is going to have, you know, an agricultural scientist and things like that are going to have a, a role in making that work. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, I just want to uh, provide a, a resource, and that's uh, coming off of the, the biomimicry question. Mm -hmm. uh, 
there's an organization called Bioneers, Bioneers, and they have a national conference every autumn in, I think it's San Rafael, California. And certainly, you know, their mission is so much about looking to, tuning into nature's wisdom and genius and biomimicry to meet the to just crazy, wonderful, wild innovations, you know, solutions over time. So I just encourage people to look that up. It'll okay. Their keynotes will end up being uh, archived. Mm -hmm. Hi, I love the talk as well and not being a scientist, um, you know, I just, I, this is really exciting work. And I guess I, I have a question from maybe a little bit different approach. And that is, you know, just like in, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, reduce is, you know, even more important, you know, um, or not making the waste in the first place. Do you, do you ponder ever philosophically, like, do, do these processes kind of maybe give Dow kind of a green light to just extract as much as they can because later mm -hmm. on they can reuse the waste and at, at what point do we look at systems thinking you know in these processes sure well so I think the um, I, I mean I guess the, the nitrogen and phosphorus are really the main ingredients in what we need to provide food for the population of earth which is probably going to grow, you know, to some higher level. I don't know, you know, different estimates. So I think we're going to need to provide fertilizer, whether it's through a natural means of nitrogen fixation, because we can't just let people starve. So I think, so I think in that case, you know, there's there's only a certain amount of reduction. I mean, you know, I think if we can convince maybe more less people to eat meat and things like that, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's probably a good thing. But, you know, there has to be a fundamental level of food available that's to support the plants that grow. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, other, uh, you know, processes, I think that, you know, that, that the reduction, I mean, we're not going to force you know, Apple to stop making iPhones or General Motors to stop making cars if people buy them, right? So, I mean, it's not at the level of the company. It's at the level of the consumer, right? So, I think we can make choices to buy fuel-efficient cars to maybe have one car instead of three and things like that. But I think if, if there's a market, then there are going to be companies that make those products. So, that's, that's the way I look at it. I look at more from that standpoint. So... Any other questions from the audience? Okay, one more online question here. Let's see. Okay, the question is, how can scientists at the U better provide support for local policies and programs, such as local organics recycling programs, to increase uh, efficiency and decrease barriers? So that's maybe a question that's asking about this, how do we reduce the waste in the first part, it sounds like. Well, I mean, I think that these, you know, biological processes would be considered organic, right? So I think this would, this would enhance the opportunity to do, or you know, organic um, type of a take organic type of approaches. So I, uh, I mean, that other than that, I don't have a, an answer. But well, that's one final question then before we wrap up today. Um, you mentioned the point you're at in your career and these three enormous challenges around carbon phosphorus, nitrogen, where are, you, where are you spending most of your time nowadays? What's the big challenge that you still have that you really want to get figured out? Yeah, so I've, um, so I, you know, I've worked in my career, like I said, in, in understanding how bacteria break down, you know, chemicals and, you know, from a, from a biochemical standpoint where you study the enzymes we'll pu publish in biochemical journals, right? And, uh, you know, that's been very gratifying and, and, you know, working with the students who go on to do great careers. But, you know, now I would like to see some of this implemented. So we're working on actually a number of projects where there is a commercial outlet. So I've, you know, I've been able to sort of, you know, from looking around enough, you know, find these areas where, 
you know, we do this work and we publish papers on an interesting enzyme or metabolic pathway, but then if we find a good enzyme that somebody can use that and, and make a product out of it that's going to reduce that chemical in the environment. So, and that, that's not always easy to do because, you know, that sometimes removing pollutants, it's an added cost, right? So you have to find these niches where, where there's a benefit to, to do that. So, but then I've been able to do that in a few cases. Well, please join me in thanking me. Thank you, Professor Wackett, for a fascinating Thank talk you. today. Thank you. We had a question earlier, Kim and I, who organizes these Frontiers events. You've probably got a mug already, so we can recycle that with the theme or give it to you. So, <laughs> I will. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. All right, so uh, just a quick note about next week. Next week we'll have another great discussion led by Jack DeWard, who's an assistant professor, College of Liberal Arts and graduate faculty, uh, Minnesota Population Center, and also Beth Mercer-Taylor from here at INE. She's the coordinator of sustainability studies. And they're going to be talking about where does justice fit in the climate change adaptation puzzle. So a different discussion, but also should be equally fascinating. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>